Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran on this second Sunday in the season of Lent as we gather together in God's house for a service that won't quite be as Lenty as you may expect as we celebrate our annual Trinity Lutheran School Sunday. We'll call it the kickoff of our enrollment and recruitment season for our pre-K to 8 school ministry. I'd like to start this morning with introducing to you Mrs. Laura Reinke. She's our youth ministry coordinator who will be talking a little bit about what we have going for our students who aren't quite so little. Thank you and good morning. I wanted to take just about three minutes to talk to you a little bit about all things youth ministry here at Trinity and get you up to speed with what's going on. Um, first of all, some statistics. Our monthly teen Bible study held the first Sunday of every month brings anywhere between 8 and 22 uh, teens consistently. Our social outings have grown from last year about 20 kids to tw anywhere from 30 to 40 and, and some of those now are starting to be our teenagers are bringing some of their unchurched friends. Our regular service projects that we participated in in the last six months for our youth group include the Tomorrow's Choice Cookie Bake, the Trinity Cleanup Day, which the youth group actually had the largest number of people attending to help clean up our grounds here, nursing home caroling, and we helped serve the Advent meal in the month of December. We have teens anywhere from 8 to 15 attending those service project activities. On another note, our Sunday school total enrollment for the year is about 45 young people, and our weekly attendance is up at about over 30 kids attending every week. So next, I'd like to tell you what's coming up with our youth group. Um, make, mark your calendars on Sunday, March 13th. You're going to see our teens, our youth, our high schoolers, eighth graders and up, participating in Teen Sunday. We're, we're getting some music groups together. They'll be doing some of the church readings. We'll also be helping with fellowship and ushering. So come to see the future of Trinity on Sunday, March 13th. 
On April 24th, we have about 20 eighth grade confirmats at the 1045 service. We welcome you there. This spring, our second graders will be receiving a Bible as a gift of our youth ministry here. And then our fourth and sixth graders will also be receiving the gift of a catechism to help them in their studies. For those of you eighth grade confirmads and up through high school, uh, make note of June 28th to July 1st. That's our Wells International Youth Rally. We have a meeting following service today to give you all the details on travel plans, cost, and how to sign up. And then finally, our youth ministry is looking forward to the return of Vacation Bible School. It'll be my ninth year uh, with Vacation Bible School here, and we'll be looking at Cave Quest following Jesus, who is the light of the world. So if that's of interest to you, of course, we have preschoolers through grade five. My teenagers like to help with that, and I'm looking for some extra adult hands. So why am I telling you all of this today? First of all, I'm going to ask for your continued support. Thank you for supporting youth ministry. I'm going to ask that you continue to support us uh, with your prayers um, and to be sending and telling other people about our, our activities. Second of all, I'm going to ask you to consider sharing your gifts. I'm always looking for drivers, chaperones, someone willing to bake brownies or some treats for our teens on a Sunday morning. And I'm looking for some adults. Any gifts that you may have, I will find a place for them this summer for Vacation Bible School. So my number's on the back of the bulletin. Call me and I'll find a place for you. Finally, I'm going to ask for your financial support. Our youth ministry, with all of the activities that we have going on, the funds that you give go 100% directly to help that. Specifically, I'm asking for you to consider, prayerfully consider, giving a gift this, uh, this spring for our teens. Two years ago, we were able to go to youth rally with 16 teenagers, a few chaperones, and personally for our family, it was a life-changing moment. I promised you three minutes, I won't get into that now. But um, with your financial support, instead of having a cookie bake for cookies that you don't really need, your doctor said you probably shouldn't be eating, we're simply asking for you to consider a gift of $5, $10, and dare I ask for $100. Those funds will help directly go to the kids who are attending Youth Rally this summer. <laughs> 100% of your gifts will go, and it will help not to give complete scholarships, but to help offset the about $700 cost it's going to be per kid. We're expecting an upwards of 20 children being able to go. I know for us it was life-changing, and if it's not life-changing for a teen that you're helping send, I promise you they will come back pumped up, excited about their faith, and sharing it with others. So keep us in your prayers. Thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Laura. God bless you and the great work you're doing with our teens here at Trinity. We now worship the Lord in the order of service that you have entirely for you this morning in the service folder you received. Let us praise his name.
please stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have committed to your church the task of making disciples of all nations. Enlighten with your wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship and serve you from generation to generation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. first lesson for this second Sunday of Lent and Trinity Lutheran School Sunday is recorded for us in the New Testament book of Acts, written from chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and members of her household were baptized, she invited us to stay in her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. This is the word of the Lord. The students of Trinity Lutheran School will now sing.
Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please stand. The Holy Gospel according to Mark chapter 10. How interested is Jesus in the little children? He loves them. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. We continue our worship with the hymn of the day on page 7. You may be seated.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if there is anything that gets your attention right quick, that is a call for help. And that cry for help can cause people to do some rather amazing things in a rush of adrenaline. I remember I was probably 10 years old and my cousin Ryan, probably three or four years old, we were in Grandma Christie's kitchen and he had one of those Brock's watermelon candies in his mouth that he swallowed. And all of a sudden I yelled, Mom! I remember my mom seeing my choking cousin who then picked him up by the feet and pounded him in the middle of the back so that watermelon candy shot out of his upside down mouth across the kitchen and hit the paneling on the other side of grandma's kitchen. A cry for help causes us to exert action. Planes fly, helicopters hover, search parties are formed, no stone is left unturned. And when it comes to a cry for help, time is of the essence. Can you imagine the lawsuits if a paramedic would just decide that on the way to the hospital he was going to pull through Dunkin' Donuts for a Dunkachino on the way? Because when it comes to rescue, time is not money. Time is the matter of life and death. If we are eager to dial 911 when it comes to help for life or limb, how fast should our fingers fly to dial a heavenly 911 when it comes to the rescue of our soul? Because we're not talking the difference, are we, between living five minutes or another 50 years. We are talking the difference between living and dying forever. This morning, brothers and sisters, on Trinity Lutheran School Sunday, I've got nothing for you when it comes to educational methodology. And I don't have a syllable to say when it comes to the scope and sequence of school curriculum. But what I hope to do this morning is light a wholesome fire of eagerness for gospel rescue in each and every one of our hearts. Help! Gospel needed. Paul and his companions were eager to help, to preach and to teach. They were on the look out for new people in new places to bring the gospel to. Maybe that new place is going to be Galatia, no. Bithynia, double no. Some big city in Asia, triple no. By the time of our text, we see Paul and Silas and Timothy at the city of Troas, land's end, for the continent of Asia, staring out at the sea with nowhere to go. They were men on a mission, currently without a mission. Until one night, the Lord dialed a gospel 911. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Behind that vision of the man of Macedonia stood an entire new continent of Europe where the gospel had not yet gone. And when the call to help was raised, Paul and his companions must have been amazed that it was Europe. But they didn't debate, and they didn't dally. They went as God's gospel rescuers. That need for help is still there, isn't it? Can be seen by anyone with two eyes in their head that, that need for gospel help. I've helped those with the gospel who have suffered from heart attacks and broken hearts, 
who have been afflicted with brain tumors and those who walk around in a mind-numbing fog of doubt. Gospel help for those who have less than a day to live and those who, being spiritually dead, have yet to live. But my people are in need of gospel help. Open your eyes and you will see the need for gospel help in our world. Militant Islam is on the march, brothers and sisters, and the West doesn't have a clue what to do about it. Closer to home, morality is on the ropes as marriage is redefined and the lines of sexuality are blurred and pornography is omnipresent. Open your eyes and look in the church and you will see the need for for help. I am told in a recent poll that 40% of 20-somethings in our land call themselves nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people with no religious affiliation who are sliding off into the black abyss of agnosticism and atheism. Schools of Christianity are in collapse in our land, 50% less enrolled in Roman Catholic schools today than in 1960. I am told that churches in our land, a major study from 2010 to 2011, found that half of churches in the United States of America did not add a single member in almost 7,000 years, or almost 7,000 churches closed in any given year. Open your eyes and look at yourself and you will see the need for gospel help as the world's problems and the church's problems become our very own. Why? Because when we were born, we were in need of rescue, not a shock of paddles to the chest or waters on a fire, but in need of life for our death and forgiveness of our sin, and all of that, all of that gospel help, Jesus gives you in the word of truth. And in that word of truth, he makes you his own, saves you from hell in our very selves, dusts you off, inspires you, and empowers you to be his gospel helpers in the world. Think about St. Paul, brothers and sisters, rescued by the gospel. He was on his way to persecute Christians up in the city of Damascus until the Lord of Light knocked him literally off of his horse and made a persecutor into a pastor and a Pharisee into a follower of Christ. No wonder that St. Paul was eager to carry out God's rescue mission. On the Sabbath day, We went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. The vision of the man from Macedonia beckoning for gospel help was one from heaven itself. But the place where that vision took them was anything but a heaven on earth. Paul was eager to preach and teach the good news of Jesus, but when he gets to the city of Philippi, there's not one single synagogue for him to preach in. And in his vision, he sees a man from Macedonia begging him to bring the gospel, but when he actually gets to Macedonia, we don't hear of a single man wanting to be evangelized. And so for several days, Paul scopes out the area, And then goes out to the river bank where he's hoping to find a place of prayer. And and there he found some women. And he taught them the good news. And by the Lord's grace, Lydia believed it. 
and the continent of Europe found its first convert to the Christian faith. And down to this very day, behind that first convert in Europe are hundreds of millions of men and women and boys and girls stretching from the plains of Russia to the palms of Spain, from the boot of Italy to the Arctic Circle of Norway. When Paul heeded that cry for help, world history literally changed. The fact that you and I are hearing the good news right here, right now, can be traced deliberately back to that point when Paul taught Lydia the truth. The truth changes things. But let me ask the obvious question this morning. How eager are you and me still today to answer the call for gospel help? Over my years of ministry, and I found that Americans are very, very willing to spend big bucks and spend all kinds of time on things that are important to them. Sadly, I've often seen that bringing about gospel rescue is often not on the top of that list. Are we still a people, brothers and sisters, that are willing to sacrifice eagerly so that the rescue of the gospel may go down to the next generation? I've heard, for instance, more than once, that church service times simply aren't convenient. But then a man has to wonder just a little bit about the miles upon miles and that people are willing to drive and the hours upon hours that parents are willing to blow out their back on bleachers in the name of not the Son of God, but watching Junior bounce a ball. Are we willing to sacrifice our time for gospel rescue? Or, I've heard this one more than once, that, you know, tuition in Lutheran schools, it it just keeps on creeping up. Brothers and sisters, if you are convinced that's the truth, I challenge you to go home and compare your cell phone and data plans to the cost of tuition at Trinity Lutheran, and you let me know where the good deal is to be found. Are we a people that are willing to sacrifice our treasure in the name of gospel rescue. Because, brothers and sisters, this is simply true. Where you find a school teaching and a church preaching and the missionary reaching, there you will find people that are still eager to sacrifice for gospel help. And on the flip side, where you find churches closing and schools in collapse, there you will likely find people that thought that gospel rescue was no longer really worth it. So ready, play with me for a moment. Imagine that the call for help was never heeded, and imagine that apathy rules the roost. Imagine that St. Paul never went with the good news to Macedonia and, and that Lydia was never ever converted. Imagine that Martin Luther said, you know what, Read, writing and, and preaching about this whole grace business, it's, it's just not worth my time. Better yet, imagine that your great-great-grandparents, poor immigrants in Little Waukesha, Wisconsin, said, you know what, this small town doesn't need a small church. It's it's just not worth the effort. And and five years later, in 1892, those same great-great-grandparents said, you know what, our taxes, they already pay for the schools in town. Why in the world would we tax ourselves and pay for another school in the offering plate? And then keep on imagining. Imagine that when it was time for your baptism, no one cared. And when it was time to learn your prayers, no one folded their hands. And when it was time for you to be confirmed, there was no pastor to teach you the truth. Imagine that. 
and then shudder a bit. And then learn the real lesson that America has forgotten. That in any time and in any place, the good news of Jesus Christ is always one generation from being lost to us. You doubt me on that? This last June, I had the privilege of visiting Wittenberg, Germany, the birthplace of the Lutheran Reformation. I took a tour of the church that Martin Luther preached over 3,000 sermons in. And then a few months ago, I read a Newsweek article that told me that attendance at Martin Luther's church, the mother church of Lutheranism in the world, Sunday attendance is between, ready, 50 to 100. We'll have more here tomorrow night for our Monday service than worships regularly in Luther's church. Why? They're in need of gospel rescue because the gospel has been lost. As a former member put it, the church really doesn't stand for anything anymore. I could just as well join Greenpeace. Now, stop imagining and thank God for what is your reality that God sent a gospel rescuer to you probably not on the banks of the Fox River but at just the right time God put water into your life as a pastor probably was who baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord opened your heart to believe in Him. He put you on a new path to heaven and washed your sins away. And then the call to a gospel rescue went out to your moms and dads and, and Sunday school teachers and Lutheran elementary school teachers who are all desperate for you to know this, that the Lord of life, Jesus, loved you and the gospel, the Bible told you so. The call to help this morning is answered again, brothers and sisters, when Jesus himself answers the call and in his supper feeds you and strengthens you and forgives you. Brothers and sisters, your reality is this. You are his. You are helped. You are safe in the Savior's arms more reality. After about a decade of decline, our church and school has once again stabilized and is on the way up. Which means it's not time to rest on our laurels, brothers and sisters, but it's time to go to urgent gospel action. And I would invite you all to dream some dreams this morning. Which of those little faces up here this morning do you think it will be that will have great-grandchildren that attend Trinity Lutheran School in the year 2090? Which of those little boys and girls' faces do you think it will be this morning that will be the full-time pastors and teachers that will go and give gospel rescue to hundreds and thousands because you gave them Jesus when they were eight? Which of the little Spanish girls' faces on White Rock Avenue do you think will be Trinity Lutheran Church's little Lydia, the first Spanish speaker of hundreds that will fill our pews? Can you picture her? The Lord already knows her name. My point is this, I tire of hearing how the church is on the ropes in our land. Instead, every one of you, I encourage you to dream big Jesus gospel dreams this morning and then commend them all to the Lord of the church for him to bless, for him to work out as he sees fit. And then, while still dreaming, that we go to work eagerly, sacrificially, that we bring gospel Jesus help to souls that are in desperate, desperate 
need. Why? Because the next generation is depending, brothers and sisters, upon what you and I are willing to do with the gospel today. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. If I could have your close attention to announcements this morning, please. We're going to do things a little bit differently between services this morning. First of all, Fellowship Hour, Coffee Hour, which is premiering new real donuts, not only the holes, but genuine donuts, will be uh, celebrated this morning in the school rotunda. If you take that middle hallway to the upper floor of the school, Coffee and Donuts will be there for you. Then between services, Mrs. Reinke will be holding a meeting up here in the sanctuary for confirmation families and also for those families that are interested in attending the youth rally, which means that my Bible study, Deadly Desires on the Homosexual Lifestyle, will be held downstairs in the church fellowship hall immediately below us and that Pastor or Professor Otto's Bible study will be meeting back in the Trinity Room this morning. If you didn't catch all of that, just ask and we'll make sure you get to the right place. Finally, a wonderful opportunity uh, this week for our campus ministry at Carroll University. They'll be meeting for their campus Bible study once again this Thursday at 9 o'clock in the Garfield Gym. And then finally, on this Trinity Lutheran School Sunday, uh, during the offering, I'd have you look at the back of your bulletin, where we don't have just a few pastors of Trinity Lutheran Church, uh, but we have, I believe, the entire faculty and staff of our school and our daycare, all in service to the Lord of the Church uh, for the building up of the next generation in His Church. With that, I would kindly ask that all of you take a moment with the friendship registers in the pews as we gather our gifts of love to the Lord this week.
Please stand for prayer. We continue our service with the prayers on page nine. We pray. Excuse me, page eight. Father in heaven, you have given both parents and the church the important responsibility of instructing our children with the gospel message and the truth of your saving word. Keep each of us from going, growing careless and carrying out our individual responsibilities. Make our homes workshops of your Holy Spirit. Guide and direct the various agencies which our congregation has established for the pur purpose of assisting parents in the vital task of training the young. Especially on this Trinity Lutheran School Sunday, we ask your divine blessings upon the families we serve. Bless our students with spiritual growth that they might learn the gospel in its truth and purity. Bless our teachers and staff with wisdom, faithfulness, and help from above to carry out their tasks. Move us to give our generous and continuing support with our fervent prayers, our sincere interest, and our wholehearted cooperation so that Trinity Lutheran Church and School may be a center of Christian education for years to come. God of grace, we thank you for allowing Rosa Welfare, the mother of Joni Stenberg, to celebrate a 95th birthday. Each day is a gift of your grace. Continue to bless Rosa with renewed strength and an extra measure of your spirit to trust you until you take her and all believers in Christ to yourself in heaven. We ask that you be with Earl Parsons, the brother of Joyce Mann, Don Parsons, and Mary Parsons, who has been hospitalized and is, serious, is in serious condition. We also pray for Eleanor Johnson, the mother of Becky Krause, who just celebrated a stroke this weekend. If it be according to your plans, grant additional times of grace to this brother and sister and keep them in your almighty arms. Watch over their family with your peace and most importantly, keep their faith in Christ strong as they look to you, their rock and their shield. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us, and together we join to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, 
which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please stand for a final word of prayer. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close our service today as we sing the final hymn on page 14 of your bulletins. We'll sing the first and the final verse. The first and the final verse of hymn number 512.